Welcome to today's webinar. Um, we're using canopy temperature sensors to guide irrigation and crop management decisions. I think you know many of you out there are going to be pretty excited that this technology and its commercialization and availability after many years of research and development through um, investment by CIDC and CSIRO has sort of come into fruition now and being commercially available this season. So this webinar is going to shed some light on the technology, sort of the what, the why, the how, the who of canopy temperature sensors. Um, it's been, this webinar has been brought to you by Cotton Info, CSIRO, Goanna Ag, Macquarie Valley Irrigators Association and the Australian Government Smarter Irrigation for Profit Program Stage 2. My name's Janelle Montgomery and I'm the Cotton Info Regional Extension Officer in the Gwaita and Mungadai Districts. And I'm joined here today with um, Ben Crawley, Cotton Info's Irrigation Technical Lead and Warwick Waters, Cotton Info Program Manager. So we have a great lineup of speakers, starting off with Dr. Mike Banj and Dr. His Jamali. Mike's a Senior Principal Research Scientist with CSIRO in Narrabri. As a plant physiologist, he's involved with a number of cotton projects around crop physiology and agronomy, including managing abiotic stress tolerance, climate change impacts, cotton systems and water use efficiency. And his Jalami is a research scientist at CSIRO in Narrabri and currently working on irrigation agronomy of cotton and other irrigation crops. His major um, focus at the moment is investigating the use of plant-based sensing techniques such as our canopy temperature sensors and thermal imaging in irrigation decision making. Um, so it's just in, just keep in mind that the project that um, his is working on at the moment is funded through the Smart Irrigation for Profit program um, and that was in stage one. It has been funded that way up until now in CRDC but it's going to continue into the phase two of the Smart Irrigation for Profit. Um, so his and Mike are going to be talking about the science behind the canopy temperature sensors. Then we've also got um, Tom Dowling, who's the director for Goanna Ag. Goanna Ag is an Australian ag tech company formed in July 2018 with a team of experienced agronomists, computer programmers and electrical engineers. Goanna is breaking down that complex barrier between growers and information data to enable more efficient resource manage, uh, a more efficient resource management system. Tom's an agronomist with ext extensive experience in plant and soil nutrition crop health and irrigation scheduling. And of course, Goanna, uh, Goanna Ag are the licensed providers of the canopy temperature sensor technology, which will be rolling out this season. So Tom's gonna to talk about how we actually use canopy temperature sensor, how, we're gonna, um, how we see the, the data and how we can schedule and manage um, our, our water. Then we're gonna finish off with um, a grower's perspective um, with Stuart Dents, Denston and Amanda Thomas. Now Stu's a cotton grower based in Macquarie Valley, growing both irrigated and dry land crops and running a grazing enterprise. He's been trialing canopy temperature, temperature sensors for the Macquarie CGA over the last four seasons. And Amanda Thomas is the Cotton Info Regional Extension Officer for the Macquarie Valley, been in this role since its inception in 2012. Um, Amanda also manages a cotton farm with her husband at Warren and, and has played a pivotal role in the Macquarie CGA canopy temperature trials. So it'll be really good to hear um, the experience that they've been having out in the field in those trials over the last four years. But we're now going to hand over to our first presenter, which is Mike Banj. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Janelle. I'm sitting, lucky enough to be sitting in Moree today in a nice, cool air conditioned office because it's certainly warm outside today. Um, I'm going to uh, start off and introduce about some of the, the concepts that relate to the use of uh, canopy temperature sensors or in, the, in we often describe as a plant-based sensing approach. And uh, being a crop physiologist and a plant physiologist for a little while, I tend to think about how plants um, grow and I often actually relate that to experiences in life and it's often my best way of describing how things work. So the, the thing about the use of plant-based sensing is really a little, a little bit along the lines of uh, if, if you were to ask me um, if I had a problem and wanted to know what was going on, one of the best ways to actually find out is actually to give me a call or talk to me directly. 
And when we're talking about uh, plant-based sensors, we're talking about actually monitoring the plant itself. The plant itself is, is the best integrator of, of what's going on. Okay, so the, the, the reality is that, um, like, like in life, actually getting opinions and insights from, from other people and other sources of information are just as valuable as your own insights of what's going on. So using tools that um, rely on the weather or our soil-based sensing approaches, they, they provide also valuable insights in terms of what's going on. So we're, we're recognising this plant-based system as part of an ecosystem of sensors and, and insights to, to help um, schedule the irrigations and understand, you know, the impacts of stress. So really, we're, we're getting the direct insights and then we're trying to bring along the other, other things that we, we're measuring. And one of the valuable and the great opportunity thing, opportunities around use, using plant-based sensing is some of the challenges that we have with using other sensors start to go away. If we're focusing on the plant as the integrator of, of, of stress and the impact of water and those sort of things, we no longer have to worry about where we put soil moisture sensors or um, how the weather's different in different road configurations and so forth. So one of the most powerful things that we do have when we're using these sensors is the fact that we can just focus on the plant and we only have to actually put the sensors specifically on the plant. I, I often pondered many years ago before I had this technology that I was quite happy to go and work out the appropriate place to uh, site a soil moisture probe in a skip row configuration and that would have probably kept me busy for 20 years try to come up with that, but um, long came plant-based sensors and that took that, that idea away. So plant-based sensors, are, there is a number of them around. We, um, early in the cotton industry, many, many years ago, we used to use things called pressure bombs. Um, it was used by a lot by the crew out at Berkways, out, out, out near Burke. They used pressure bombs to try to help schedule irrigations. Um, in other industries, predominantly horticulture industries with trees. We use things like stem and sap flow meters or even stem diameter meters. Um, and obviously we use canopy temperature um, as one of those other measures. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the limitations of those different sensors. The pressure bomb, for instance, is, is, is a complicated bit of gear. Um, and often you have to actually go at a specific time of day to get the right sort of measure. Um, and it's not easy to use. Um, it's also a very expensive bit of gear to have for one farm. Um, stem flow and sap, sap flow and stem diameters, they actually uh, I, I can work really well, but do often require a number of years to calibrate um, the sensors. And I'll talk a bit of, little bit about in a minute about why we can use canopy temperature and how to avoid those sort of problems. Okay. So why, why now can, canopy temperature? Um, I think I seen in the past, I think in, there's been references to use of thermal, um, thermal sensors in crops to measure stress back in the 1930s and 1940s in terms of um, trying to understand how these, how these systems work. But you can see on the, the left of the slide with the, the gentleman holding the, the infrared gun is that the challenge with, with that system is that you measure, a, essentially, you have to go out at one point in time and can try to measure differences. You have to uh, measure the same time um, instantaneously and often the crops could be just stressed simply because of the time of day not necessarily because they are stressed and then you know the, the, the principle of using canopy temperature is that all we're really simply saying is that um, transpiration just like our evaporative air conditioners or in, in an evaporation sense the more transpiration occurring often the cooler um, a canopy is when it has access to water and when we have less water in access to the plant, there's less transpiration occurring. Um, um, and a consequence of that is the temperature of the canopy in the leaves actually increase. It's as simple as that. Um, it's like turning, if you were to have less water going through the pads in your air conditioner um, and evaporating, that, those, those pads would be hotter. The other aspect of what I've said that is the fact that we can actually monitor these, these things continually. And the power of actually being able to monitor the crop over a, a period of time as opposed to instantaneously is essentially that we can actually use um, smart algorithms and, and knowledge of the environment to back essentially take out the environmental effect and truly understand what um, the effect is on the plant. So that's one thing is the continuous aspect of it is that we can monitor over a time and understand how those dynamics exist. So if I look at the 
If I look at the diurnal pattern earlier in the day with canopy temperature between the stressed and the irrigated crop, you can see that there's no difference in the canopy temperature because of the time of day and the temperature that exists at that time of day. So the continuous measurement is really what we have to do. We have to actually back it, um, understand the environmental effects. There is another aspect of being able to, and I refer to the fact that things like um, stem diameter and um, sap flow, that they have to be calibrated, is that you have to actually find the line in the sand that you're comparing those measurements to for your particular environment. In the case of the canopy temperature approach, we're approaching the physiology in the same way that we approach our um, physiology with humans. We all know that our temperature or human physiology is, is 37 degrees. And if it goes above that or even below that, we often can understand that, that there's something going on that is affecting our, our health. Plants are very similar. They have an underlying physiology or an optimum temperature. And we're basically using that um, understanding as the line on the sand. So when we know the temperatures go below above a certain level, we know that there's something, the physiology has been affected. affected. Um, so it, the approach is very similar to what we use in human physiology. Now, the other thing is that um, like humans, I can go to the other side of the world and walk into a doctor's surgery and they're using the same physiology, 37 um, and temperature um, in a in a doctor's surgery on the other side of the world. So it's very um, these temperatures are very species dependent and means that we can move into different environments very quickly as long as we're working with the same species um, and, and start to understand the health of these plants. So for cotton, um, that optimum temperature, um, we've actually looked at this these optimum temperatures based on the um, um, biochemistry level, the enzyme level, right through to the outcomes at a physically physiological level and, and growth. Um, and here's we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But it's about 28 to 32 degrees is that optimum temperature in terms of um, ensuring optimum growth for cotton. And that this will change for different species. So we've been recently doing a little bit of work in tomatoes and we're finding that, for instance, that, that temperature is a little bit lower for tomatoes, for instance. So I'm going to talk about our cotton journey. Yeah. And just, and here's is going to go into the detail around um, the science behind this. So for us, we, we recognise that um, we've taken a concept that was borrowed from one of our co colleagues um, in the US, from James Mahan, uh, Dan Upchurch and John Burke from the USDA Stress Laboratory in Lubbock. They're the ones that sort of introduced this concept. And in fact, they were instrumental in building some of the first wireless canopy temperature sensors to, to enable this work to happen. Um, we, it was actually a conversation that I had with um, James Mahan back in 1998 and I said this, this concept looked really, really fantastic for drip irrigation and overhead systems where at that time they had plenty of water. Um, I said, I asked the question, how does this work? How would, how would this concept work in furrow irrigation? Um, and that was the instigation for the initial work by Warren Connolly in his thesis. So we wanted to see whether the same principles applied. Um, but the same principles from US cotton applied to Australian cotton and Warren showed that yes, they did. And then we embarked on testing those concepts in furrow irrigation. Um, and on Roydy Coast was the postdoc draw fellow that actually undertook that work in that context. So then we, we basically, you know, have been through a process of validating this on crops um, through Australian cotton regions and, and testing that approach. So I'm going to hand over to Iz, who's now going to talk about some of the underpinning science um, relating to our cotton journey. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, joining us today. So as Mike said, I'll just um, introduce you to some of the technical stuff um, around um, canopy temperature and um, some terminology that we use in this space um, as well. Um, so as Mike said, our work builds upon the uh, biotech approach, which um, was originally developed um, by James Mahan and his group in US, and then we sort of um, added on to that. The way it works is um, it uses an optimum temperature, um, which is crop specific. Um, for example, as Mike said, Warren's um, work showed that 
28 degrees, roughly what um, the optimum temperature, optimum canopy temperature for the, um, the physiological functioning of cotton. And um, the number of hours canopy temperature stays above 28 degrees are called the stress hours. And then the third term is um, the cumulative stress hours since the last irrigation um, are called deficit hours. And um, to qualify as a stress hour, the algorithms also correct for situations when relative humidity or solar radiation uh, might be limiting. For example, in a high um, humidity environment, canopy temperature might be higher because um, high humidity limits the plant's ability to transpire and cool itself, um, and not because of the lack of soil water availability. Um, and similarly, solar radiation is also required for plants to trans transpire and cool themselves. And in both these situations, um, higher canopy temperature is not a function of lack of water. Um, and this is taken into account in the, algor in the algorithms um, that, we, that we use. And when the deficit hours reach a predetermined threshold that is based on the research that we did here um, in Australia, it triggers an irrigation. And it is really important to have this threshold because it is linked to crop physiology and helps interpreting the data in different soil types and environments. For example, um, crop in a lighter soil will reach the threshold quicker compared with a heavier soil because of less soil water availability. Or in a situation, um, and this again means we don't have to calibrate canopy temperature sensors for different soil types if we stick to this algorithm. Um, and in a situation where, for example, an irrigation did not fill the soil profile completely, the crop will reach the threshold quicker again because it will run out of water that is needed to maintain canopy temperature in the optimum range. And in many ways, the canopy temperature approach um, works similar to um, deficit irrigation principles. When the deficit hours, um, for example, you can see in this picture, uh, in this graph on the y-axis, uh, when the deficit hour reaches the threshold, which is shown by this um, red line, it, it will trigger an irrigation. And once an irrigation is applied, it resets the deficit hours back to zero and start again, and so on. And um, it also resets the deficit hours if there is um, sufficient rain. This is Coast, you can see in the picture, who was involved in um, development of this, um, these algorithms uh, a few years ago. And um, he worked with um, some growers in different valleys to investigate how these, um, how fields irrigated using canopy temperature only were com um, compared with the grower practice. Um, and these were some of the growers which were um, high achievers in their own valleys. And um, we really appreciate the support of these growers. Um, in these trials, the yields were um, largely similar as you can see there. Um, so this is the yield and this is quality and this is the number of irrigations applied. Um, so the yields were largely similar um, and in some instances uh, we managed to achieve the same yield um, with one less irrigation. And again these irrigations were scheduled remotely using canopy temperature only and without any knowledge of soil water status. And if we complement canopy temperature with soil water data in real time, I think we might be in a better place regarding getting our irrigation timing right. So there is definitely a case for combined integrating different technologies. And for the same trials, this graph shows a comparison of the irrigation timings of the farmer practice on x-axis uh, in days after sowing and, um, and the irrigation timing estimated based um, with the canopy temperature sensors on y-axis here. The closer the points are to this one in line, uh, one in one line, um, one on one line, sorry, uh, shown in orange, the closer the comparisons uh, match up. And as you can see, the irrigation dates were similar between grower practice and canopy temperature approach more than 90% of the um, times. And um, working with these girls has been really invaluable 
um, and we continue to learn more from many growers that we um, work with in this research. Um, this graph shows the relationship between stress that was measured through canopy temperature and yield in different um, row configurations that were exposed to varying levels of water stress. The x-axis here is um, showing the stress the crop was exposed to between irrigations, which was measured using canopy temperature, and y-axis is um, showing yield. Um, when irrigation, and this is the threshold that we recommend for to apply an irrigation, and as we move away from this threshold on towards the right, the stress keeps increasing and we lose yield. We also now have a model to predict the canopy temperature um, several days in advance to get an idea of when an irrigation might be um, due in um, near future, so we could plan ahead. Um, as many growers would appreciate this, um, that not everyone has the flexibility to um, be ready for an irrigation on a one day's notice. So we're really excited that this might be um, helpful in adoption of this um, technology. Now, some of the strengths and weaknesses of this technology, um, it is relatively straightforward to implement and maintain in field. Um, the errors do not propagate over time as the system self-corrects on the go. And one of the strongest features of this technology is that it, it integrates the soil, plant, and environment interactions. So we are getting first-hand information from plant on whether it's happy with the water it has got and when it might need a drink. The um, sensors are readily available from third parties, and now the algorithms on how we think is the best way to use this technology are also available through GoNIAG. Um, as canopy temperature is a response to soil water availability, it does not require calibration for soil type um, if we use the uh, recommended algorithms. Um, and some of the disadvantages, are it is sensitive to errors if the sensor is not maintained well in the field which basically is, uh, requires just the adjusting the sensor height. So it is about 10 to 20 centimeter above the canopy. And if we don't raise it uh, regularly, the crop will grow and sensor will be under uh, within the canopy, which is not representative of the overall canopy temperature and can cause errors. So it's important to um, keep an eye on the sensor in that sense. Um, and unlike satellite-based techniques, the canopy temperature technology, again, has to be implemented locally um, within the field, um, within, within field sensors. And I thought I'd, I should give you a quick overview of uh, some of the work that we continue to um, do and we'll plan to do some more trials in the coming season. Um, I think a lot of our focus um, is still on making the canopy temperature te uh, technology in its current states um, to make it available to the industry in its current state um, for using in fully irrigated system, um, which has been our focus. But we are now also um, investigating how we can use um, this technology um, in limited water systems. Um, as Mike was mentioning, it monitors the stress in real time it, and it might help um, growers understand how the crop is performing in different row configurations. Um, and then the another area we are looking at is to use it in during the early season. At this stage, um, we are not able to use canopy temperature um, before, let's say, first squares um, because, the, because of the smaller size of plants, which results in overest overestimation errors caused by the hotter um, background soil. Um, so um, we'll be testing a new uh, multi-pixel sensor this season in collaboration with um, um, Alison McCarthy from uh, USQ to see if we can separate the plants from soil, as you can see here in this one. These are the little ones are plants, and then the orange hotter surface is the soil. And um, if we have multi-pixels, then we, can, we, we might be able to separate plants from the soil and then extract the canopy temperature. I think and this will enable us to use the canopy temperature right from the start of the season. Um, and we are also um, looking to investigate the spatial variability on the farms um, using a combination of drone um, technology and, um, and multiple canopy temperature sensors. Um, so this work is important um, for us to determine um, 
whether using more than one canopy temperature sensor in field might have some um, benefits. So we have um, two um, trials planned, one each in Moss Creek and one in uh, Goyder Valley um, to answer that question. And I'll just finish off with um, this, um, as Mike was saying, um, we are part of a broader ecosystem of irrigation management that includes a range of information, tools, and technology that we can take advantage of um, to make the best decisions for our farms. And integration, integrating information on soil, water content, how plant is responding to that water, and short-term weather forecast to consider future demand might help improve our decisions on when to irrigate. We can use techniques like VeriWise that can help define how to irrigate. Uh, we can use Oscott model and short and long term, long -term um, climate forecasts um, to help us evaluate risk of different strategies. Um, we have to look into the mar um, global market insights on what are the returns that we can expect uh, from the investment um, on our farms. We, of course, need wireless um, and portable technologies and, of course, and better coverage to make tools available to growers in remote locations, um, satellite and other, any other imagery that can help us capture the special variability that we see on the large um, cotton farms. Um, and with that message, I will hand it back to Janelle and thanks again for listening. And we're going to hand over to Tom from Go in a Rag. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so I just want to take you through what um, the Go Canopy means to us, what we can display with it through the data, and how it, how it is integrated into um, what we call our Go Field solution. So, Go Field, we see Go Field as our integrated water scheduling solution to more accurately schedule your irrigations. Um, Go Field it combines three products of ours. So Go Probe, which is our, which is our soil moisture probe that measures the root zone of the crop. Um, it's an 80 centimetre probe with a, with a sensor every 10 centimetres measuring moisture and temperature. It gives um, site-specific daily water use and estimates the irrigation date from the latest daily water we use. The Go Probe, measures infiltration, root development, and work we've done over the last four years, subsoil constraints as well. Um, we also combine GoSat. GoSat is our, is our product that's based around the Irisat algorithm, which we commercialise into the, into the GoField solution. So GoSat calculates your field crop water use in ETC, and, and using a 12 kilometre grid forecast of weather data package from the bomb, we then forecast 10-day daily water use. Um, GoSat provides also sub-weekly NDVI and NDRE imagery at a 10-metre resolution. And then at the end of the season, we do a crop summary report on how many day degrees that crop um, endured, heat and cold shock days, water use efficiency in bales per megalitre and dollars per millimetre. And then finally, um, just recently, we've brought our go, of course, Go Canopy um, into, into our integrated solution. And, and what we see Go Canopy doing basically is it brings a doctor to the field. Um, we're measuring the temperature of the plant. So we measure the stress hours accumulated by the crop. Go Canopy then allows us the ability to set refill points more accurately than ever. Um, the Canopy sensor allows us to enter the ability to then display the seasonal stress that that crop has, has or has not endured and correlate that to a monetary figure. This coming season, Go, Go Canopy is available in Laura WAN, so under our Laura WAN network. And then in, in the very near future, we'll also have a deploy anywhere um, low cost satellite option. In the, the hardware of Go Canopy, we read we take a reading every three minutes, we filter those readings, and then we send them, send the averages every 15 minutes. It's a, it's a very small device, it's wireless, um, works on batteries, no solar power, and um, it's a very easy and user-friendly device to deploy in the field. So I'll just um, now I'll just show you um, 
some of our graphing displays. So what I'm just trying to show there is how it originally, how we originally showed Gofield on the root zone, which has got the um, estimated irrigation dates, not just from the probe, but also in the purple line from, from measuring crop water use at a field level and then forecasting that daily water use to the refill point. So now in bringing in, in bringing in the canopy temperature sensor data, we're able to overlay that on the root zone graph as well. So we, so we give, well, as we're getting close to that accumulated threshold, um, we start to show a, a yellow period of all warning zone period that we're getting close to that onset of stress. And what I've done there is just tabulated, obviously, where the onset of stress has happened on some data out of, the, out of Oklahoma for us and where the refill point is set. And then just showing how, how we're able to display how many hours or days that crop was under a stress and, and then tabulate that into a return on investment. So we're showing there that three days of stress um, during the late flowering period can incur anywhere from 2.7 to 3% 3, 3 yield loss per day. And, and, and from what I've worked that out of that, just one, conservatively, but 1% 1, 1 of stress, um, you're looking at a loss of $50 per hectare per day. So this coming season, our, our go field will cost $1,200 for a seasonal hire, which includes all three of the products. And if you work that out on an average size of a field of 50 hectares, um, conservatively of 1% of yield loss per day of, from a stress incurred is, is an average um, loss of $2,500 per day per field. So you're getting a 100% return on your investment by, by using these two tools to more help you more efficiently um, irrigate your crops. The graph below it is showing the, the temperature that's coming from the canopy sensor, as well as um, ambient temperature from the sensor as well in the field. So that way we're able to, to do, do some diagnostics on whether the, whether the sensor, the ambient temperature sensors is telling us that we're picking up more of a soil influence or, um, or that it's working how it should and we're able to then show that, um, that those cumulative, um, cumulative days of stress as they accumulate to, to where they bridge the threshold where the crop is actually in stress. So then at the end of the season, um, like I said, with our GoField product, we're able to give you a seasonal report from you putting in your price and yield, which will then give you a, a total water use or total ETC crop water use, um, rainfall totals for the season, day degrees, heat shock, cold shock days. We'll also obviously um, bring in what sort of days were, were accumulated in stress hours. Um, and then we do your water use efficiency summaries in in kg per millimetre, bars per megalitre and dollars per millimetre. So yeah, that's just a quick photo of um, one of our Gofield sites, which you can see the little, um, the little canopy temperature sensor um, unit there in front of one of our Laura Wan soil moisture probes. And now I'm going to hand over to Stuart Denston and Amanda Thomas down in the Macquarie Valley. And they'll tell us, a, give us a bit of a grower perspective on how they've been using canopy temperature sensors. Thank you. Thanks, Janelle. Um, I suppose initially we're just assuming, I guess, that um, everyone's had a chance to look through the case study. So we didn't want to sort of te tediously go through that. Um, but I just thought, Janelle, I'd just talk for a couple of minutes about where we kicked off and where we got to. And then a lot of those questions that have been coming through um, are quite relevant, re uh, sorry, relevant, um, just practical stuff that we've had to deal with over the four seasons. If you wanted to direct some of those to us, if there's time, if there's not, that's fine. But um, Okay, so um, just from a rewind perspective, um, we came out of the 2013-14 summer um, with some major questions um, around irrigation scheduling and particularly on, on heavy dirt, grey clay with a really high bulk density um, where our yields suffered 
unbelievably because of some hot weather. Um, that was the year where our soil moisture probes were not giving us, um, I suppose, consistent enough data to prescriptively schedule irrigations. Um, and we sort of, we had some massive periods of cavitation um, in the crop and, and, and the crop just couldn't pull the moisture out of the ground fast enough and get it around the plant. And um, um, after that, you know, we're probably, we're probably a couple of bales down that season on where we thought we should have been for the type and style of canopy or bush that we grew, um, if that makes sense. And then we got to the cotton conference, I think in 2014, so directly after that season. And that was the start of Rosie Broderick's sort of you know, revelations around, around canopy temps and cumulative stress hours. Um, so we were quite keen to have a crack at it. We got some funding obviously to start some trial work. And then that 2014, 2015 summer was the first one we, we used them, um, the sensors in that season. Um, and we had them across the valley, as per the case study, we had them in everything from drip irrigation, um, overhead sprinklers like laterals, pivots, flood irrigation, bankless flood as well, and, um, skip. and skip row as a bit of a left fielder um, to compare. And we tried to put them in different soil types as well. And that first year was um, like basically the cumulative, once we, once we um, evaluated all the results, the cumulative stress hours correlated to yield on every place. So we thought, geez, we're onto something here. We need to keep this trial work going. But as all good research... <laughs> um, On-farm trial work, really? On, yeah, <laughs> sort of the, ne the next year that wasn't the case and there was sort of no correlation between broadly cumulative stress hours and yield. Um, and then all the way through the four seasons, there was and there wasn't sort of light bulb moments in terms of what it was, what we were getting out of it. Um, but what we do know definitely after the four years um, is that we, we know we need something else other than just the soil moisture probe. Um, we want to get off this prescription treadmill of 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 the whole you know how we all learnt to grow cotton um on time based on timings and dates and sticking to intervals um we know now that you know some growers have very little room to move around water orders and particularly in the macquarie um where at the bottom end of the river system they're on a 14 day um lead time for their orders it's very hard to adapt unless you've got a res and you're prepared to, depending on your energy costs of recirculating water and, and so forth, and you, and you set up in systems, unless you're prepared to um, manipulate your timing by a couple of days by the use of a res and on-farm water pumps, um, yeah, this probably, technology probably isn't um, of value. But for those that, that can and, and do that, I think it's, it's got... Um, value for money, it's, it's got a good fit um, in conjunction with the soil moisture probes, that is. Um, so importantly, what we see in the Macquarie, obviously like in some other valleys are the same, but we're the home of variable soil types. And even on one farm, we can go from a, a lighter alluvial type porous soil at one end of the development to a heavy grey clay at the other. So. Um, yeah, that's we sort of tend to grow different canopies based on that, but quite often those fields are subject to the same or similar water intervals. Um, and looking back, looking back on each interval is it's 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 quite handy to be able to see the cumulative stress hours and also certain days at which things really flared up. Um, and having that quick reference or guide to actually walk into your crop when you see a spike in temp um, or, or, or whatever, and you can reference it out, actually feels. And you just sort of get a feel for, for that. 
um, and how that works. Um, you do have to be disciplined, we found, with the hardware, I think, to get accurate data, as opposed to a soil moisture probe that goes in the ground and it's kind of set and forget other than some, you know, if, other than if a fox buddy chews through a cable or um, all that type of thing. Most growers don't know what's happening under the ground with that hardware and they can't really do anything about it either other than making sure the solar panel for the batteries, you know, in a good spot um, or so forth. But with the canopy temp sensors, we've been through all the hard dramas of, um, yeah, yeah, working out. You've got to be disciplined in terms of moving them up, keeping them 30 centimetres above the canopy um, and, and making sure that, that they're working. Yeah, make sure there's no spiders or anything and making sure the solar panels and things like that are clean. But in saying that, I think what it gives you as a manager is just a better understanding of where your crop's at. One thing we really looked back on was, you know, how many accumulated stress hours did I have this time last year? Am I tracking the same? And in my head, I know which one was the bumper crop and which one, you know, wasn't so great. So I kind of want to avoid getting into that stress period. So that's where we're sort of looking at playing around with different dates and things, but also just getting that, we call it the happiness value. Like was that last interval of seven days, how, how often was that plant happy or did I push it into the red zone? You know, then I'll need to readjust my next interval so that I know that I'm trying, you know, not to go there again. I know it's a, it's a temperature thing, but there is times when it can cool itself in really hot weather. And we saw that, um, we saw that quite a few times. And probably the other thing I missed um, was that most of the years, if not all of them, we used them, were, we didn't experience a cool and or wet summer. Um, so we really came to sort of continue the use of this technology, especially on heavy soils, um, when, we, when we do experience, you know, a cooler, cloudier type wetter summer, like most of the ones we've had them in, there's been two perfect, almost, well, almost perfect seasons with high yields, so mild attempts and lower, lower nighttime temps, and there's probably been three that have been quite extreme hot, hot dry summers. Yeah. So, so, so I think, I don't think we yet know or understand what the benefit may be to us in cooler, wetter years by, by overwatering wet soils um, because of that prescriptive treadmill we talk about and having to stick to intervals and um, having to stick to lead order times and people without reses and so forth, if that makes sense. So there's actually a question in here. And um, so if all the presenters want to just unmute themselves and um, chip in, but, um, you know, does canopy temperature show reduced plant happiness when the soil is saturated? So maybe, Mike, do you want to start off? It has to be very saturated. It has to be very waterlogged to pick up that. Then, uh, so the reality is when you get very waterlogged plants um, that have endured for a period of time, the transpiration actually does decline. The, can't take up any water, it doesn't take up anything. So you will see an increased um, canopy temperature associated with quite a lot of pollen. I have not seen it, I have not seen it um, in any of the studies that we've been doing. It tends, tends just to be cool and use lots of water, um, not actually to that degree of uh, it has to be fairly serious that, 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 that situation to occur. So you could, if, if we were in a very wet season, we could use these things to tell us that the crops are waterlogged, but I think we'd see the other effects well before we see canopy temperature. Um, anyone else wanted to comment on that at all? Otherwise, um, there's a question here from um, asking, and this might apply with you, Stuart, in the different systems. Has there been work done to compare canopy temperature under overhead systems with sprinkler at night through heat waves versus flood systems on the same farm? 
That is, can we reduce stress at night through sprinkler irrigation? Um, probably, we best way to answer that is, Mayor Thomas would be able to expand on that after this. Like, we've got all that data. We had sprinklers and flood and everything in the trial for four years. Um, no, we definitely got that data. And you do see, yeah, we, there's, there's obvious differences in canopy temps between irrigation systems. Yeah. Absolutely, 100%, especially drip. The drip guys said they would never have really used one um, just because, I guess, they're just, you know, giving that certain amount of mills each day. And, and, but we actually sort of wanted that in the trial as our benchmark because that was our non-humid environment because humidity and the vapour pressure deficit really impacts on how a crop can cool itself. Um, and it like the more I look into all this, the more that's where my head, you know, I guess that's what was impacting. Because we saw days, really hot days, where, you know, one crop would cool itself, uh, you know, and was three degrees cooler to the point where we thought there must be something wrong with the sensor. And then whereas another crop, in you know, it wasn't. So it's just that humid, like whether that humidity plays a big role. I think that's pretty, Mike probably knows more about that. But, yeah, I think that impacts it for sure. Yeah, um, and, and on, uh, Amanda, just to respond to that in the context, you know, it's no different from when we're using our air conditioners. Um, the principle's no different, you know, it's humid, we can't get that evaporation to, to, to cool. So an important part of the algorithms is to basically take out that humidity effect. You know, there's, be the, the inst there's going to be instances where we need to basically take, say that, well, the crop, the crop is hot because it's humid, not because it has lack of access to water. So, um, and the other the other way that we also get around problems in the way we accumulate stress out is that um, the continuous the ability to continuously monitor the crop over the course of the day actually tends to actually um, dampen the signals that are um, related to things like humidity. So, if it's stressed from water. Um, we're going to pick up some of those signals uh, much earlier in the day and much later in the day. Um, and may not, we may not see them in the middle of the day, but it's, it's not just that one part of the day that we look at um, a sort of signal. So the, the, the secret source to, to ensuring that we get these things work is the, the continuous monitoring and the right algorithms to back out the environmental effects. Um, so, I think there was another quick that, that, that it related to one of the, the broader questions about um, are there conditions when the crop cannot keep its temperature at the optimum level? We just talked about the humidity and we, we recognise that. Um, we have seen instances where um, disease and those sort of things have actually impacted um, the canopy temperature. So there are there are instances when the crop is not healthy that we see these, see these effects. And in fact, we actually use canopy temperature in some of our cropping systems around the world to actually identify when, when we can tell when the crop is not operate, operating at its optimum canopy temperature and when it deviates from the optimum, we're able to actually detect whether there's a disease or not. And, and I've been asked to talk slower and clearer. Oh, that's good. As a Queenslander, I'll be drooling at the moment. We, we also saw one time when there was a field that got some really quite severe um, hormone damage and it, it was just off the Richter scale the whole season, just without that leaf surface. It just wasn't able to cool itself. So that was another area where it can impact it. So, so we're really, um, Amanda, that's a great example. And, and we were ex really excited. I, I, was, I encountered a... Um, an instance in California recently where they were, um, there was a disease in their citrus called green citrus disease where the, um, basically the oranges weren't going from orange, they were staying green, it was a disease. And they were using the canopy temperature to actually detect the stress signal on the orchard of the disease. Um, so they were actually using canopy temperature in the, in the orchards to pull out trees before they saw the disease so it wasn't spreading. So that, the sensitivity of that signal can be very strong when, when there's some of those things going um, going amiss. We might um, if move on to sort of the practical use of these out in the field, and there's been a few questions on that. So, um, Tom, you may like to lead this. 
Um, but, you know, they're asking questions as to how many you need, how many meals, how often you need to move, adjust them for height. Um, yeah, and does Go Field actually, um, it's, it, yeah, it's an on site um, piece of technology as opposed to being satellite based? So, Tom, you've unmuted yourself. Can, would you like to just comment on? Thanks. Yeah, just to answer the quick one about um, go field, um, do we need the centre in the field? Yeah, currently we do. Um, yeah, as far as how many we need in the field, um, his, I believe, is doing some work this season on um, putting numerous amount of sensors in the field to see whether there's um, where it becomes um, impractical to have more than a certain amount and, and as also um, as far as economically um, economically not valuable. So we'll know more about that. Basically, we're just, we're putting them with our, our probe units at the same site, which is obviously usually in most situations um, looking at start of sets and end of sets. I expect there's, you know, do like um, Stu mentioned, different soil types, the ability to split off the canopy possibly and for some different soil types to get some more information in the field, maybe not for the reason to change your year, year irrigation scheduling because it's already set for that field, but to um, to see whether other areas of the field are coming into stress earlier than earlier than where you are in a particular soil type, or also if you are looking at um, where you normally have one at the start of an irrigation set and one at the end of an irrigation set maybe looking at fields in between that set to make sure that they are they are all coming into um, that irrigation date at similar times and you're not you haven't got a field that is coming in in earlier and stressing before you're you're actually getting water to that field. And are you doing so you're doing the installations of them on site? Do you also go and move do the uh, sorry move the height of the um, canopy temperature sensor over time or is that for the grower or the consultant to do? Yeah, we look to um, we will look to have that relationship, obviously, with the con consultant or agronomist in in moving that this coming season. With with what we we obviously will install them, or our or our agents in different areas will install them. Um, with where we're obviously excited in the future is is the multi pixel sensor because that will hopefully give us that ability, and that's also why we're only hiring it this season because we. We believe we'll have a, a different um, option next year with the multi-pixel, and that'll allow us to to set and forget, basically. Hopefully, with the with that technology of taking, being able to hopefully in the near future separate the, the soil from the plant, so we can have them at a pre-diagnosed height at the start of the season, and and that's where they stay up. Um, can you also just explain Laurel when in nice simple terms? <laughs> Okay, well, it's basically a long range, low power radio frequency. Um, so for us, what it, it's brought to, to our business is we're able to give lower cost hardware with um, lower ongoing fees. So we're able to get the data off the farm in areas where we haven't got cellular coverage more affordably and, and also with ongoing fees, the more sensors you have, obviously, um, less expensive going forward as well with those types of sensors. Um, and in, you've, on your website or somewhere I've seen um, like the coverage of Laura Wan at the moment across the cotton industry. Have we got a, is that on your website, Tom? Yeah, we'll update that and we'll, we'll put, that, um, put that back on our website as well. We've got about 3 million hectares covered from, um, three and a half sort of nationally, but about three, three million um, in, um, underneath the cotton industry going basically mainly from here to here to Griffith, from Gundawindi to Griffith in every valley. And we're also starting to get a network, we've got network coverage in Theodore, from Theodore to, to um, Maura, and we're also starting to get some good coverage around the Emerald region as well. Okay. Um, any other um, comments, Stuart or um, Amanda, in terms of that practical application of them out in the field? Obviously, things are fast-moving uh, 
pace here and think the technology is changing, but um, how you actually found it? Yeah, as Tom said, it might change going forward with that other technology, but the stuff we had to use, um, I guess we just trusted, you know, we sort of went off where a soil moisture probe location decision was made because it's I think it's a similar principle at this stage, you know, you sort of want a, an area that's or a site that's relative or representative, sorry, of a of a field or a management portion or a soil type. Um, but yeah, we made sure we had always had one in in alluvial dirt and one in heavy grey clay. Um, in terms of moving them up, yeah, it's it's a bit of a nightmare. Like when the crop's rapidly growing um, early to mid season, it's like yeah, every week if you haven't done it for the week, you, you'll get there and it'll be engulfed in leaf. Yeah, all the readings will go a bit crazy, and you'll know that that's you've got to get out there and move it up. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's, there's a question on the new uh, predictive model. Um, so you're developing a model for pred predicting canopy temperature to plan ahead. Um, I guess how far off is this work? Is it going to be incorporated into, um, you know, like GoField, for example, um, or is it just research? And um, yes. Uh, so it's the research has already been done, and we are currently working with. Um, Tom to sort of um, incorporate it in Governor's uh, platform. Um, so it's in progress and the uh, um, idea is that it should be available um, to growers when they start to use canopy temperature. And how many days out will it be predicting? Um, Mike, can you remember that? Um, it's accurate to um, five to seven days. Okay. And, um, and the, the, there is a question there, is it regionally based? Um, no, no, it's uh, because it's, um, it, 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 it's, um, it just, it's not fixed. It, it uses the incoming weather and all those, um, and, and the existing canopy temperature to predict forward. So it, it doesn't depend on the, it will use the local weather and so it's not region dependent. So I, I think the vision, the vision around this is that, um, and I, is that we get access to localised weather forecasts. So it does use the, the localised weather forecasts, um, and there's you know improvements in that going on all the time. Um, but the actual algorithm and the forecasting are, uses some smart analytics, and it's actually sensor dependent. So it actually learns, it actually calibrates and learns from the sensor as well as the forecast. So it's very specific in that sense. So the future of a lot of these sensing technologies is, is the more you collect data, the more it learns about its situation and uses that understanding to tell, it, tell, it, tell, it, tell the sensor what it should be thinking as it goes forward. And that's it's using smart analytics in that context. Very good. Right, Aaron. We're just going to finish off with, there's a couple of questions that came out of the work that Stuart and Amanda did in the Macquarie. Um, so the first one, are there times when we need to look closer and do our best to minimise the stress accumulation or are there times when we can actually push, push it out, it being either stress hours or irrigation date, I assume? Okay, so interesting. So the, the, the thing about our algorithm basically says um, when the crop is stressed, it's stressed regardless of... Um, so it is losing when it's stressed. Now, I always use the expression stress is stress and uh, um, it would be impacting yield. Often a bit of a confusion around this, this thing is that as we're approaching the threshold um, and making a decision about whether to irrigate, um, we often need to know about whether we can actually, whether we need to irrigate tomorrow because we might be um, going over the edge of the threshold or we might be able to hold back based on the forecast. So one of the really exciting things about this technology is that we using the forecasting algorithm is that we can actually see based on the forecast um, and, and the prediction of stress in absolute terms whether we should, where we're able to sit on um, pushing the irrigation out and whether the chance of, and we're not risking the crop if rainfall may be occurring. So that the idea is that if we're getting, we can see that generally the, the, we're not going to go above the threshold 
we might sit on not irrigating for a, a day or so um, and actually capture rainfall if, if that is the case. And our analysis shows across the industry that there are situations, I think we, we work on a, a principle and we've done the analysis, that um, that, that instance when it, when it does rain at any time, we can, we can capture a whole irrigation from, from rainfall once every three years. I'm having confidence not to irrigate and not go above that threshold. How does, does that answer that okay for you, Amanda? Yeah, no, no, that's good. Um, I, yeah, I guess we were just sort of not up when we wrote those, not up to where the research was actually heading and, and we were hoping this was going to be the case. So it's pretty um, good news for us. Okay. The next question was how much do night temperatures affect our overall yield potential and what are the danger periods and can canopy temperature sensing help us monitor this? It's possibly. Um, there's no question the canopy temperature sensors can monitor how the crops get during the night. We can be, um, our ability to control it is limited, but I think that comes back around to that original point about the irrigation system. So where irrigation system can actually influence the night temperature, if you've got an environment or a saturated soil and a very low um, humidity, um, the environment itself will be cool, so the crop will be actually cool itself. So irrigation systems can that by just creating the, the cooler, evaporative environment. Um, so there's no question that canopy temperature can monitor this and actually show what, um, show how hot our crops got through the night. Okay. Well, we've run over time. I'll just the final question they had was can we get to a point where we can get X amount of stress hours at X point of crop development and know where we are sitting? So the, the algorithms and the thresholds are relatively crop development independent, but I think um, here showed really the opportunity around the impact of the stress. So when we talk about the accumulation of stress hours, when we go over the threshold, not deficit hours, that when we actually above the threshold, we can actually we can actually understand what level of impact that we're having on the crop in terms of yield. So the level of refinement, you know, Tom showed the the, the means by which he's estimating the impacts on yield. Um, we're looking to take that to a whole new level in terms of um, X amount of stress hours will 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 actually impact your yield by this much. And so it will come back around that we might be able to start thinking about how we actually manage our limits of water and when is the best time to ensure that we don't stress the crop versus you know, the chances of stressing the crop and, and having less impact on yield, if we've got those choices. Thanks, Mike. So I don't think this is gonna be our only webinar on canopy temperature sensors. There'll be some more as people start using these. Unfortunately, we're all facing a really tough season at the moment. Um, but you know, as as we um, as we use them going forward, there's going to be more and more questions, I suspect. So, um, but today's been a, a you know a, a good start. So, um, just if there's further information. Um, there's a couple of case, or well, there's a case study that's been done in the Macquarie that's available on the Info website. Um, there's also an article in the last Australian Cotton Grower that um, his and co pulled together, and also in the Spring Spotlight magazine. Um, but we, and we've also recorded today's webinar, and it's going to be posted onto the Cotton Info website. But can I just say that, um, you know, there's been a lot of work put into this technology over many years and it is really exciting to see it come to fruition now with its commercialisation. And um, Mike just might like to say a couple of words. Yeah, I really just wanted to thank everyone um, who's been involved, us, involved in um, delivering the technology and helping us to um, identify the issues. Um, I, I'd like to acknowledge the, the support that we've got from um, Cotton Research and Development Corporation in, in funding the research, acknowledging our American colleagues from the USDA who actually helped to um, facilitate the approaches. So they've, they've given us a lot of input in terms of uh, the understanding that we've needed to deliver on the technology. 
Um, sensors have certainly been a, a, a major challenge for us um, when they weren't necessarily commercially available or, or uh, appreciably cheap enough for us to be able to buy many of them um, so we can do our research. So I'd like to acknowledge the support that we got from CSIRO, um, the High Performance Plant Phenomic Centre in Canberra for helping us to, to get canopy temperature sensors. And, and, and yes, and, and the valuable insights that we've got from the growers and the and the, the collaborators that we've had in terms of um, undertaking our research. So thank you very much. Um, thanks, Mike. So yeah, I'd really like to thank our presenters, Mike Banj, Fiz Jalami, Tom Dowling, Stuart Denston and Amanda Thomas for taking the time out of their busy schedules to be part of today's webinar. And thank you to all of our participants. We ended up with about 57 on. Um, and so, as I said, it's going to be recorded. This is an evaluation that if you didn't mind, you can either click on, sorry, write down that link or you can put your camera up to the QR code and that'll take you directly to the evaluation survey and we'd really appreciate if you take time to do that. I'll also be emailing it out to all the link to each of the participants. So, as I've said there, there's no excuse really. <laughs> we look forward to getting your responses and it'd be great. But anyway, thank you very much and, um, and we'll see you on our next Cotton Info webinar.